Welcome into this skill session in our UML series where we're going to talk about class diagrams. Now, if you're doing software engineering, there's a really good chance that your class diagram is going to be the heart of your documentation. Personally, I like to use the entity relationship diagram quite a lot, both for uh, drawing up concepts and for implementing them afterwards. But if you're doing a school project, you're doing a large scale software project, then the class diagram is where to be. Now, one of the main downfalls of uh, class diagrams is that um, they can grow pretty big pretty fast because you're listing a whole lot of things for each entity. So a good way to get out of that is to make two different versions of it. Have one version that simply states the name of the class and then how all of the classes fit together. Then you can draw areas inside of that where you say, well, for this area, we have a more complete class diagram. You can also use the component diagram to actually show how all of that fits together. So maybe you can make a component diagram that just shows that this is how the components talk to each other and then only make class diagrams that work within a specific component and then you know connect things together in that way. But without any further ado, let's get into this, uh, this central piece of modeling for software and talk about um, um, class diagrams. One last thing before we start drawing them though, you'll often run into analysis class diagrams and design class diagrams. Analysis diagrams are meant to be an early version that's very much incomplete, but just gives you an overarching idea of what it is you're going to build. Whereas a design class diagram is going to be way more complete and it's going to be something that you keep on updating. So if you need to add a function to a class, you're going to go back to your design, uh, to your design diagram and or your design class diagram and add that function to that class. So you can always get that overview um, of your application. And when we move on in the next video to sequence diagrams, we're going to build on this. We're going to use the class diagram. So a sequence diagram actually doesn't make a lot of sense without a class diagram. And like I said, a class diagram could possibly just be a diagram for a single component. So I hope you can see how all of these diagrams really fit together and build on each other to be more and more specific into what it is we're building here. Now let's draw it. Click start and then create new diagram and select the class diagram. Create. And this is going to be my library class diagram. And once again, we have some different things in here. So let's take a look at what they've built for us because there's a lot of concepts to unpack in here and it's going to be difficult to make a brief video that goes into all of the concepts of this diagram. It is a more complex type, right? So let's start by looking just at the boxes. We have a couple of boxes here and each box represents a class in our object oriented um, application. So here we have uh, an address class and a person class, uh, a professor class and a student class. Um, but it seems like this person class is an abstract class and an abstract class is one that has some things implemented, but also some things that are, are not implemented. So you can define a function without actually implementing it, which means that you cannot instantiate the class in and of itself. You can only instantiate um, something that inherits it or implements it like an interface, but you know, it, it's halfway between its own class and an interface. So that's why we have this student and this professor, which is two different implementations of a person. So we cannot say that a person has an address, but a professor can have an address. A student can have an address because we're using this uh, implementation, this interface, this abstract class to say that a professor has a salary, a student doesn't. A student has a student number, but a professor doesn't. But they are both persons or people uh, that have names, phone numbers, and email addresses, uh, and maybe purchase parking passes. Now, the next thing that we want to look at in the squares, just to finish them, is that we have um, up top just the name of the class. This should be one-to-one, -one, something that you can find within your um, application. If you're building this uh, as a class diagram that shows something from multiple different components, then you'll want to write the name of the component 
like this up here on top. Um, we can hopefully make this a little bit prettier. Well, maybe we can, yeah, there, we, there it is. The next thing that we have up here, these in the first in the top square, that's our fields or our variables in our object oriented uh, class. And next to them, you can write either a plus or a minus or nothing. And that's uh, to say to say whether or not this variable is, is it's, it's the access modifier. So if it's publicly available, if the name can be uh, seen by other classes around it directly, then it's public and you'll have a plus. If it's something that's only available internally, then you'll have a minus. And there's also a default access modifier. So if you don't have a plus or a minus, then I would expect that this variable is going to use the default access modifier, which means that when you're implementing it, you're not writing private, you're not writing public, you're not writing default either, you're just not writing anything, then you're going to get that default access modifier, depending on the programming language, of course. So that's what we have up here. In the bottom square here, we have all the functions or when it's object oriented, you call your functions methods. So you have all of your methods down here in the bottom and um, and you would uh, say that, well, purchase parking pass, I don't think this is going to be an accurate way to write it. Uh, neither would this be, by the way, normally you would write things out the way that you would uh, inside your application. So this would be name. Um, it could be with a capital letter if that's the naming convention of the programming language that you're using, but then this would be phone underscore number. Uh, this would be email underscore address or just email. Things like that. Uh, and these would probably all be private. Uh, so that means they cannot be accessed or modified from outside classes, but only by functions within the same class. So uh, the reason for doing that is, let's say we have a set name. Um, then we would want to say a plus out here to say, this is public. All of the other classes can actually call this one. And then they would need to probably use, um, uh, they, they won't need an identifier for it because this is already the object, right? But they would want to set a new name. So we need some kind of a variable here to set a new name. And we define that in here to say what parameters are we taking? And then we can um, set a colon to say that we also return something. So when we see something like this, this would be like your uh, method signature in your programming language to say, I would expect that this is going to now be a public method. So if it was Java, for instance, this would be a, um, a public string because it returns the name. Uh, so it's not a void, it's a string. And then I'd say set name. And then as parameters, it would take name, then it would do something with that. And I can't see that right here in the class diagram, but I can see that it's going to, ret to return a name. And since name is not a data type, it would actually return a string. So that's uh, the complete setup for something you would have down here. That's all of your functions. And that defines the whole square. So if you're building across components, then you would have your component up here. If you're not, then you won't have anything. You'll just have the name of the, the class that you can see in the others here. Top one up here is going to state your variables and whether they're public, private, or default. Uh, then down here, you will have your uh, your functions or your methods with their, with their method names, the parameters that they take, and the data type that they return. That's the squares that we work with in class diagrams. Now they connect to each other with arrows and there's a couple of different arrows to use right here. And there's a couple of different types of lines. So you have this triangle right here and the triangle means that there's some form of implementation going on. So in this instance, a professor um, is a type of person and a student is also a type of person. And what they have in common is that they both have addresses. So this arrowhead means that, that these classes right here implement or extend this uh, person class. Now, if this was an interface, then I would write that in here as well. 
Um, but if I'm implementing an interface, I would make this line dotted. So if we were to say that, um, well, actually, in, if we're using Java as an example anyway, we can move this down a little bit and just say that <laughs> well, what, what, what could we say? This is a type of animal, right? So uh, a person is a type of animal. It, it probably has a type, um, but that type is not being shown anywhere and, and there can be a set type, which would take a, uh, a string and maybe return a string. So this is just going to be the method signature, right? Um, but this is going to be an interface. So let's write that in here to say that this is an interface. Then the, the way that we would implement that interface is with uh, the empty arrowhead that we've already seen. Uh, where is it? There it is. The big empty arrowhead. But then the line would be dotted like this. This means that we're implementing an interface, whereas this line right here means that we are extending an existing class. And it would never say component here, by the way. It, it would say the name of the component. So, so in order to make, make this more of an example, I would say user, right? And I would also say that this is probably all something that has to do with the users, so we're not going to use it anyways. So that's an interface right here. And you know that that's two different schools of doing this, either the component or or the types, you could also write that this is a class or whatever. Now, that's two different types. So let's say that we have an address right here. Uh, we do have an address right here, um, but that's not so interesting. I think a good example here would be to say that there are some classes right here. And a class has a name, it doesn't have a phone number, but maybe it has a, a room number or stuff like that. And then uh, that could um, have a uh, list of students. Students. And since it's a list, we would do something like that. And then we could uh, plus add student. And that's going to take a student. And we could uh, remove a student. And when I'm not adding the colon after, that just means that I'm not going to return anything once this happens. So, um, so this now means that a class, and by the way, I don't think in most programming languages you can actually um, make a class named class because it's a keyword in the programming language. So let's call it course instead. Uh, so this course has a number of um, students in it. So first of all, the line here is not dotted because we're not implementing anything. <laughs> well, we're implementing the code, but but it's not an implementation line. Um, but then we have that arrowhead right here where we can use um, this one if we say that it's a composition. That's terribly small, but but uh, we can use this uh, filled out um, diamond shape if we want to say that it's a composition. Or we can use the empty one if we want to say that it's an aggregation. Um, that's going to be the one right here. So this means aggregation. Um, does it look better with the other shape? Maybe it doesn't. It's a bit of a shame that it looks so bad. Anyway, so this means aggregation. So what does that mean? What's the difference between composition and aggregation? Well, when you have an aggregation, which is what we have here, that means that 
we have a, a one-to-many relationship, but it doesn't really matter too much. A course can exist without students. Uh, if we said that a course what was nothing but a collection of students, then that a course was just a way to to combine students maybe with uh, with a classroom or something, then a course wouldn't make sense without having both that classroom and those students. And so then, it, then a course would become a composition of the two. But right here, a course is a bigger thing that can have a professor, they can start putting teaching material into the course, and we can do a bunch of different things. But one of the things that we have in the course is that there's a list of students. And for a significant amount of time, you know, until the semester comes along, that that list of students can just be empty. So that's why this is an aggregation. That's what the meaning of an aggregation is. And that also means that when you're going to implement it, you're going to implement this as an empty list. This is private. So that means that you cannot directly manipulate the list, but we have a function in here to add students and another one to remove students, where we can just pass a student as an argument to do that. Now, that's the uh, aggregation composition arrowheads. And then we talked about the implementation arrowhead. The last one that we have up here is the reference arrowhead. So that's just uh, the, the normal type where you just have your, your line with, with your two lines uh, that go out from that. <laughs> that's, that's terrible to show on video. But you know, uh, you can see it right here. So that arrowhead just means reference. So this class reference is this one. Uh, it would probably be the other way around. Normally, an address would would uh, reference a person and, and a person wouldn't reference an address uh, because that way a person can have multiple addresses, but an address can only house one person. So uh, that, that just means that you'd have two addresses that are the same or, or have the same information in them if you need to have two people on the same address. But if you change the address, you won't be changing it for multiple people. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. On these lines, we can have, and once again, this goes into a bit of, of the style that you choose to use for your diagram. You can have these numbers on it, like in the uh, in the entity relationship diagrams that we had just before. You know, we had these one to many, many to many, and and one to one relationships. Right here, we uh, we're saying what's the minimum and maximum. So we're saying here that that um, a person has one address, and an address is connected to zero or one person. We could say that this was uh, zero to many, or we could say that it's exactly one. It could also be exactly 17, if that makes sense somehow. Um, so these numbers are not, are not defined to be any specific interval, but there is a number. You can use two dots to say that there's an interval and not just a specific number, and the star means whatever. Um, so many, actually. And once again, this is a style thing. You can remove them and say, well, not in my diagram, <laughs> or you can have them and put them on everywhere. You might just put them on in, in a couple of cases where they make sense and then leave them out where they don't. Then you have this last one here, which is just um, an explanation of how these two uh, uh, entities or classes um, refer to each other. What is the relationship between these two classes? So a person lives at an address and you could have down here, you could say a professor is a person, but that wouldn't make a lot of sense because that's what the arrowhead is already saying. But we could copy this and uh, take it down here to say that a person uh, is enrolled in a course, right? And, and since this is object oriented, you might want to maintain two different lists to say that well, a course has a list of students, but the student also has a list of courses. If you feel like that would make your application better. It all depends on the context, right? So that's the, that's, that's the idea. You can build this for a simple, uh, for a single component, or you can build it for the whole application. If it grows too big, then you just only use the, the top square here where you're saying uh, what the name of the class is. And then for each of your components, uh, you can build it a little bit more detail, but you have all of your fields and all of your methods. You have your access modifiers out here, and then you have your, um, your for your methods, you have uh, your parameters and your return types. And by the way, a name is not an entity. So this is actually taking a string. The name of that string is not relevant. 
these examples right here are wrong because they don't have access modifiers. They're not set up as uh, as actual methods. Um, but um, anyway, then we have outside of these boxes, you know, in the boxes, we can either uh, set something extra to tell us whether this is interfaces, abstracts, or classes, or we can use this as a way to say that, uh, uh, that this uh, class belongs to a specific component. Then on the arrows, we can use dotted lines to say that we are implementing something, or we can use uh, full lines to say that there's a relationship. Then we have the arrowheads where we have the triangle, the empty triangle to say that this is an implementation. This is an is a relationship. We can use the empty uh, diamond shapes here to say that it's an aggregation, uh, which means that there is a list that can be empty. Or we can use full diamond shapes to say that this is a composition, which means that this is a component that needs to exist in order for, for, the, other, uh, for the other class to, um, to be able to create an object. Then we have the last arrowhead, which is just uh, the simple lines right here, the normal arrowhead, which means there's a reference, so one knows about the other. Generally, when you build these diagrams, uh, it can be easy to fall into the trap of just having your application build it for you. So if you're making a Java application with IntelliJ, then you can ask IntelliJ to build a class diagram for you. And you might want to do that, uh, but not as a way of building your application for a number of different reasons. First of all, when you're building your application, you want to build this first before you start programming so that all of the developers can look at it. So you can have 100 people developing the same application when you have the same diagram to develop from. You won't start doing anything where your line of thought drifted from each other because you have this common blueprint for the application that you're building. Um, but the next thing is that that the diagrams that you're that you're then getting from something like an IntelliJ, they're accurate. They definitely are, but they're not showing you what the application was supposed to be. They're showing you what the application is. So you should use them as a way to make sure you did things right. So if you were trying to build an aggregation, but you ended up building a composition, then you need to figure out why that is, or maybe change something. And if you start having like multiple lines between two classes, and, and you'll see this a lot of times, and then you'll have like three, four, five lines between two classes, you're not supposed to have that. So maybe there's something wrong with your implementation. There could, there could be a good reason, sure. But in most cases, it means that there's something wrong with the code that you made. So you'll want to take that into consideration, figure out what's wrong, and then fix your code accordingly. So that's why you build these diagrams up front to make sure that you know what it is you want to build instead of just you know hammering your head into the keyboard and then exporting a diagram afterwards. That, that's just not how you do software engineering. Now, like I've said a couple of times throughout this video, class diagrams can end up becoming really, really complex. And that's why we try to differentiate uh, between whether this is an, a simple overview and analysis class diagram or if it's an accurate full uh, design class diagram. Now, I have this one book. I'm not particularly fond of it. Uh, it's called Software Engineering, The Current Practice. Um, it has a co couple of good things in it, but it's not really something that I would recommend. But it does have one single quote that I agree with a lot and that I've used in a lot of projects and in a lot of contexts, which is a UML diagram can either be complete or accurate. I don't remember the exact quote, but there is something to that effect in this book. So what that means is when you're building a complete class diagram of a large scale enterprise application, it can be a helpful tool, but you shouldn't expect it to be all the way accurate. You can build an accurate class diagram, but you shouldn't expect them to build that accurate diagram of the whole application. So divide and conquer. That's always the way to build something large scale, divide and conquer, even when it comes to modeling. Build your component diagram and then a class diagram of each component. Um, so that's, um, that's how you get to and that's how you build your uh, class diagrams. Now, like I said in the beginning, your class diagram can really be seen as the heart of your models, right? Because this is what we've been building towards and we're going to expand upon. So in a lot of cases, uh, especially if you're in a school project, 
your teacher and your sensor will just skim through your report until they find that that the coveted class diagram. Then they'll skim through that and they'll have an idea. Okay, so this is what they're building. And then they'll start looking at the rest of the report from that because it is the easiest way for a software engineer to get an overview of your application. Uh, maybe if there's a component diagram, context diagram before then, they'll take a look at that. Uh, it, it's really helpful and it gives a higher scale perspective. But looking through those three diagrams, you'll have the good overview without going into details about anything. But you would want to go into a bit more detail because once you now get from, you have this overview of the application, you're gonna start, uh, you're gonna want to start building functionality that revolves around the users, right? So you have all of your use cases, all your user stories, depending on if you're using a unified process or if you're using a scrum or something like that. And for those user stories, you'll need to make some form of um, documentation to say, how exactly is it that I'm going to implement this use case or this user story? And for that, you're gonna use a sequence diagram. And the video on that is up next, and it's gonna be linked either here or here. See you over there.